Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA for short. Let's get to it. In past lectures, we've talked about President Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace initiative, first announced in front of the United Nations General Assembly in 1953. This established the idea that countries with high levels of nuclear capacity should share that technology with other countries, in return for those other countries promising not to develop nuclear weapons. The international body that came out of this to carry on its mission, and in fact sometimes still uses the slogan Atoms for Peace today, is the IAEA. Much like how the Non-Proliferation Treaty is the central law in the Non-Proliferation Regime, the IAEA is the central international organization within that regime. And also like the Non-Proliferation Treaty, membership in the IAEA is very widespread. Almost this entire map is blue. And that's because there are a lot of benefits to being a member of the IAEA and very few downsides. As a consequence, the exceptions on this map are few and far between. One of those exceptions is North Korea, although actually North Korea was once a member of the IAEA. You'll recall that in 1994, there was a falling out between the non-proliferation regime and North Korea when it was alleged that North Korea was violating some of its safeguard agreements. North Korea pulled out of the IAEA in response and has never returned. Another entity not in the IAEA is Taiwan, although, like North Korea, Taiwan was once a member. However, when China's representation in the United Nations transitioned away from Taiwan and to mainland China, Taiwan had to leave the IAEA. And like North Korea, it has never returned. A few notable countries that are in the IAEA are India, Pakistan, and Israel. That might be somewhat surprising given that those countries are not a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty as a consequence of them having nuclear weapons and not being one of the recognized states. But the IAEA predates the Non-Proliferation Treaty by 13 years. And perhaps surprisingly, compliance with the Non-Proliferation Treaty is not a requirement for membership in the IAEA. As a consequence, these countries can still be members despite their status with the Non-Proliferation Treaty. As a result, the only other countries that are not members tend to be very, very poor. The structure of the IAEA is very similar to that of the United Nations, though the IAEA itself, perhaps surprisingly, is not a subsidiary of the UN. They do, however, often work together, given that they have common goals. The main body of the IAEA consists of every member state. This is roughly equivalent to the United Nations General Assembly. But like the United Nations, there is a body within the IAEA that serves as a governing board. Membership here is much more exclusive. The most technically proficient countries will stay on the board year after year while there is a little bit of rotation among the less technically capable countries. Being on the Board of Governors is important because the Board of Governors dictates the policies of the IAEA and figures out how to spend the money that the IAEA has available to it. What does the IAEA actually do? Well, it has three main functions. The first is safety. The IAEA wants to ensure that nuclear technology is used responsibly. That means not having any nuclear lab employees being exposed to radiation, up to more serious concerns like not having a duplication of the Chernobyl incident. They will also go to accident sites to best figure out how to handle the situation, as here they are doing with Fukushima. More generally, the IAEA is interested in creating best practices for countries to follow and publishing that information, essentially creating a library of knowledge that the world of nations can share. The second main function is the traditional Atoms for Peace project. 
The biggest part of this is to create a multilateral institution to assist with nuclear power plant projects. But if you look back to the membership map, it's not just countries that have nuclear power plants that are members of the IAEA, nor is it countries that are in a reasonable position to aspire to having a nuclear power plant. That's because nuclear technology is useful for smaller scale initiatives. An important one has to do with agriculture. You can use nuclear technology to irradiate pests, essentially render them infertile, and then reintroduce them to their natural habitats to try to mate and crowd out the fertile versions of those species. This results in overall lower pest quantities, which can increase crop yields. These types of projects get funded under the IAEA technical program. However, getting help today is very different from how countries might receive help in the past. The big day of reckoning came in 1974, when India did its Smiling Buddha test. Much of the infrastructure that India used to create that nuclear weapon was through Atoms for Peace style programs. And as a result, the international community had to rethink how these programs were run. Two big initiatives came out of that. The first is the Nuclear Suppliers Group. This is a committee of countries that have the technical capacity to help others with nuclear technology. By forming this committee, they hoped to create regulations to make sure that technologies that were shared would not make it cheaper and easier for other countries to develop nuclear weapons. The second thing that the regime has done is become more careful with what materials are handed out. Imagine you're a recipient like Taiwan, and you need to have fuel to run your nuclear power plants. The way this works today is as follows. The United States will give you 5% enriched uranium fuel, that contains 5% of the fissile uranium-235 atom, to the recipient. The recipient will then put that into their nuclear power plant and create energy. Running the power plant creates nuclear waste. The recipient country is then supposed to take that nuclear waste and ship it back to the donor country. The donor country can look into that waste material and verify that everything that is supposed to be there is actually there, and what has been handed back is consistent with the recipient country having run the nuclear power plant for energy. If all of those boxes are checked, then the cycle begins anew, with the donor country giving a new round of fuel to the recipient country. There are only two weak links here, and even then, they're not all that bad. One issue is that the recipient could take the fuel and not run it through a power plant, could instead try to use that to help build a bomb. The problem is that 5% enriched fuel really isn't good enough. This is just low enriched uranium, and you need highly enriched uranium, containing about 90% uranium-235, to actually build a nuclear weapon. So even if you had this fuel, you would still need a uranium enrichment facility to get up to the point of having a fissile bomb. To be fair, having 5% enriched uranium is better than having unenriched uranium. And indeed, it is more difficult to get from naturally occurring uranium to 5% uranium than it is to go from 5% to 90% enrichment. Nevertheless, having 5% enriched uranium does absolutely nothing for you if you want to build a nuclear weapon if you don't have these uranium enrichment facilities. This stands in contrast to how previous agreements worked, where some nuclear power plants would actually operate on highly enriched uranium, and thus 90% enriched uranium would be shipped to the recipient countries. The other weak link is post-electricity production. The nuclear waste product created from power plants contains fissile plutonium. If instead of handing back that radioactive waste to the donor country, you kept it for yourself, well, you might start getting somewhere there. But again, taking that radioactive waste by itself does absolutely nothing for you. You need a plutonium reprocessing facility 
to actually take that plutonium that is inside of the nuclear waste and separate it from everything else. Absent that, once again, you don't have a nuclear weapon. As a result, this system is proliferation proof as long as you can ensure that recipients don't have uranium enrichment facilities or plutonium reprocessing facilities. Limit those two technologies, ENR technologies for short, enrichment and reprocessing, and you don't have other countries developing nuclear weapons. And keep in mind that even if recipients can secretly build those facilities, the system itself is still somewhat resistant. Every time there is a shipment made, there is an expectation for what is going to be returned. And the donor country is going to make sure that the exact amount of material that's shipped back is consistent with the amount of material that was given in the first place. As a result, if the recipient were to cheat at any point, it wouldn't really get all that much material, but it would be denying itself future shipments of fuel, which means it's going to lose out on a lot of electricity production. The final main function of the IAEA is to provide safeguards and material accounting in a manner similar to what I just described. Indeed, under Mohammed al baradei's term as the Secretary General of the IAEA, this was the biggest task ahead of them. Father of the Pakistani bomb, A.Q. Khan, had set up a nuclear black market, and the IAEA had a primary role in tracking down that black market and trying to shut it down. Part of the safeguards role is to conduct weapons inspections. This was perhaps made famous in the lead up to the Iraq war, when former Secretary General Hans Blix was tasked to figure out what Saddam Hussein was up to. However, the details of weapons inspections are quite complicated, so we'll save that for another lecture. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.